there, good morning. Um, where I'm from, this is a fall tidy up, tidy up with me video that I wanted to make for you all to encourage you to tidy up your garden. So maybe you can take me along in your pocket as you tidy up your own spaces and feel more encouraged to do so. So the inspiration for this is all the, the tidy up videos that I've been watching in order to tidy up my own house. I love tidying up with other cleaning experts um, and declutterer experts as they go along then I, I, am, I am doing it along with them. So welcome to Bethany Farm. Today we're going to tidy up um, the fall garden using the checklist that is in a link in the notes um, that accompany this video. So if you look at the descriptions, you'll see a, a checklist that you could print out that would be handy to, um, to do your garden with. So you can customize this according to what you need. And one thing that's not on those, on, it's a bit noisy, one thing that's not on the checklist, there's six steps on that checklist, and we'll go through them, is the first step in permaculture, which is observation. So I would love to see here how if I have I have a large property and and I and I still feel like in a smaller space you would be looking at perhaps this which is the front garden needs a lot of weeding as you can see but and here we'll we'll take a look here but as you can see here if I were just to go about my business I mean um, I probably notice this fig has been chomped up by deer and that's a, a sign for me to just pause and wonder what I can do to prevent that in the future. Um, what weeds are growing is another thing. It's mostly grasses. I, I could definitely need some help weeding this. But um, what can I do to preserve this food? And what other things can I highlight? Like there are beautiful flowers hidden amongst these weeds. Um, and that's just one of a small space. But I'll take you, I'll take you, we'll come back to this space. Because the first step of this, oops, as we will see here, the first step is actually um, harvesting. So let's go and see what we can harvest in our permaculture garden. So here is another bed that I have. Let's see if you guys can see this. Let's see a so this is a possible solution to that fig um, problem that I have, is maybe I can trellis it. Maybe I can not trellis it, not net it, so that, so that the fig is not being munched up by the deer. So here, what can we harvest? It's easy to think in the middle of summer, especially when you're really busy with a lot of the growing and school start and the end of summer as well. School starting, lots of busyness to neglect harvesting our, our um, basil, our herbs, so this is an opportunity to do just that. And I'm going to uncover, uncover this because there's not going to be deer in the middle of the day. There'll probably be a few things. And you can see what all is growing. So it's a very intercropped mix. Intercrop meaning we put a diverse array intentionally of plants so that you get a better yield, better performance, because everything works better. I think I can't see myself anymore. <laughs> everything works better in a symphony, together in an orchestra. Everything works better as a collection of things. Let's see if you can see. So we have pollinators here to attract butterflies and bees to pollinate a watermelon. This is the end of the summer. Watermelons are one of the last things to, to yield. One of the last things that you transplant out at least. And it's the beginning of the fall. So this is actually my 
fall garden maintenance is to harvest. So you look over here and you get your snip. So I'm gonna go grab my bucket. And you would start harvesting. So I just wanted to show you before you begin, I do have like a handy bucket and I've just made, I know you can buy these things that hang on. I've just made this from other aprons I own. Uh, but I have here a really cool tool, not for harvesting in particular, you could use it, more for weeding. It's a rice knife for harvesting rice. And it was given to me by Rutsu in, on Etsy. So shout out to Rutsu in Portland, Oregon. Uh, fellow permies there, who gave this to me many years ago. It still works and I haven't taken care of it as much as I should. But I love using it to just weed chop and drop which is something we do in permaculture where we chop and drop in place to sort of act as the cover crop for the soil um, as the winter comes months come in as the cold comes in you have no bare soil you're still covering your soil throughout these cold months or wherever you live if you live in a not so cold place you still want no bare soil okay so here you can see Maybe we'll put this here. Much, a lot of bare soil, <laughs> but not as intensely planted as I would like because you can still see some like soil peeking out, which is fine because things are growing, um, a mixture of weeds and such. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that I harvest what I want to harvest. And sometimes your harvest is a flower, which is absolutely fine. We need to harvest, you know, things that make us happy. So I'm going to try harvesting the basil for sure. And then have your bucket with you so you can harvest it into your bucket. Ooh, nasturtia seeds. We're observing things. We're observing that there are holes in my basil. Hmm, it smells so good. Let's see where, which of you guys are starting to form melons. I'll bring you closer in so you can see. Mm. Can you find the melon? There's a little baby melon forming. You guys are so late, but that's okay. They had a hard time because I think the chickens just kind of got into this place. And I have baby kale growing. If you're wondering what this is, this is alfalfa or lucerne. Not that grass. <laughs> this is alfalfa and lucerne. They're edible as shoots, actually but they are also great nitrogen fixers. So I'm leaving them there so that I have no bare soil. But if I wanted to plant something in its place, I would know that if I pulled it up, the soil underneath would be really rich. I always have this Liliatris, um, what is this? Persicaria weed growing. I have no idea what it's used for, but again, I'd rather have it than no bare soil. Sorry, Kale. I guess this can go into our green juice for this morning. Mm -hmm. Hmm, interesting. Um, when I find a plant that I don't know what it is, I use an app called PlantNet. And I take a picture of the thing that I want to know, I have a feeling it's like morning glory. Here you go. And this is some, sometimes it can it can identify an image just from its leaf. So bear with me while I do this here and see what you and what are you doing? Wow. This is going on. Are you harvesting? 
what is coming in from your garden it's going to be impossible so id the plants use photo i have no idea this is not going to come in to too many too many different plants at one place i also have some broccoli broccoli leaves coming in okay so i'm going to keep this open just before i wake the chickens up and so that some of these things get pollinated and we'll go to the actual harvest places and we'll put you back in here to stand Here's our production garden. More harvest. There we go. This would be make, make a really great breakfast. Every day we get about a handful. This is its first year. Hmm. I'll grab this. And tomatoes. So I'm going to put this on like super speed now. Slow. What is that called? Slow. Um, oh, uh, one of the other things is cleaning up. So one of the things on this checklist. these things on this checklist is <laughs> is to tidy up the garden as in cleaning up so that means a lot of weeding a lot of picking up stuff that you can see here is untidy and so as I do this I'm gonna put this on super speed for time lapse and you guys can follow along back again I have my snips and I also have the um, garden checklist so I'm stepping on my rhubarb <laughs> the garden checklist okay so we did harvesting which is what we're doing now and I'm going to cut these up into nice the nice thing about like when you harvest one is you need a container <laughs> to harvest in two second is um, you if you can get some of the trimming done of the harvest so for instance i'm not gonna cook so the leaves of rhubarb are poisonous but the stems when you cook them down are not this is what we eat this is the edible portion so i'm not going to i'm going to keep a leaf here as my plate and use what i have right and i'm going to get just the leaves so as you harvest if you can already pre-trim your um the things that you're you're harvesting that would really help so this will take a, a little bit of time what are you harvesting right now uh, right now what's coming in the garden as you can see on my right here swiss shard we have so much spanakopita we really have a lot of food in september from the garden <laughs> whereas earlier in the year when the other might um the other mammals were still more active like a groundhog 
that was not the case. We would have to compete with the groundhog for food. But now it's really nice and pleasant and the temperature is much cooler. It's so much nicer to harvest. There we go. This one, so when I see that something's like diseased, I will usually put this in the compost and that's one of the other steps. So let's kind of review these steps as I so harvesting right now um, beets are coming in, Swiss shard, a lot of the herbs like I said. And you might want to take in some of the flowers. So if you see, oh this is a nice calendula that I'd like to have inside, indoors, and to extend the blooming of that calendula, you could repot them. Uh, sometimes, so this one, I will chop and drop into compost, and I'll show you my compost bin later. And, and so if something is not diseased, but I don't need it, like here, I can use that as a plate, but this one, I don't need it. it it's not diseased, it's a healthy leaf. I am just going to chop and drop it in place like this and it becomes living mulch because there are nutrients and there is a microbiome on its phyllosphere, on its leaf um, surface area that will help fertilize the soil. So both in nutrition, meaning there are some nutrients in this leaf that could be feeding, that are drawn up the plant draws up from um, its roots and they are stored in the leaf section of the plant if you had to analyze it and there are also good bacteria so that all goes here to cover the soil because what did we say no bare soil and if something is diseased then it's just like not a good thing I'm gonna go put it in the compost bin where it can break down and stabilize and become usable come fertile soil eventually as it as it breaks down so many things so much rhubarb what are we going to do with all this rhubarb <laughs> we're going to eat it compost compost or you could just compost the whole thing if you wanted to lots of slugs in there all right, so I'm gonna leave these guys. I'm just getting the best stems. And the smaller ones too. Okay, so you guys are going to the compost bin. And I'll show you what that looks like in a little bit. And you guys are going to the kitchen. Okay, so one other thing. So we did clean up, well, sort of. <laughs> we did, um, th this would be a good time to drain your rain barrel if you have one, uh, in case, because what happens is if we store the water in the rain barrel, then it'll expand. So use it all up and then close it. Gather debris and trash, um, and then repot, which I mentioned. And then finally, maintenance cutting down crops to the stem so not exactly to prune yet because it's kind of early for that pruning trees or pruning um, perennials but if for instance you see like what I just did with the rhubarb right I'm cutting it down to the stem and there's more to cut over there it, it makes sense because it's it's going to harbor disease if I leave that, um, if I leave these leaves in the ground, like 
and you can't like you can't be 100% sure that you know, if you do it if you chop and drop something that's diseased it could very well decompose and be fine and become part of fertile soil so there's no like hard and fast rule but in general if you don't want the next batch of brassicas or whatnot to be diseased and this one is really susceptible I have to say it's always giving me these things so what does that indicate either um, there's and there's something here that it's probably, in my opinion, too crowded. And I think it would benefit from trimming. And it probably, that, that might be enough to solve all its, like, uh, all the fact that it, it gets all these, not all, but some yellowing leaves could just be a lack of space. And that's all you need. It just needs a little bit of aeration. A little bit of cleaning up and then it's happy and rhubarb's a perennial so it's kind of a nice a nice thing to have it's a perennial it's a great ground cover as you can see covering the ground and look for uses for these leaves <laughs> they can probably be the equivalent of banana leaves and line your your plates if you don't want to use um to wash as much where did i put that over there okay so Lots of other things to harvest, but I'm not going to stay in the harvesting phase. We'll leave that to the kids later. There's a lot to harvest. I can see tomatoes. And I'd love to pan this around and show you just a little bit of what's going on in terms of harvest. So yesterday, so talking about compost, one of the things I do is compost tea, is make compost tea. So tea or water solutions from compost. And this is something that I super drenched with compost. And this is something that you could totally tidy up. Tie up, it's flagging, it's at the end of its season, and it's still producing. Um, probably not ripening as fast anymore because of the cold weathers, but it could benefit from some tidying up so it doesn't infect the, you know, its surrounding areas or, or stay in the soil. Mm, so I'll, I'll do that really quickly, then I'll show you my compost thing. Full stop Can't believe I live in your thoughts I think about you all the time Morning, evening, and midnight Such a wonderful delight Forgo Give up everything that I Unexpected love was found You're the rose in a garden And it shows if I'm honest You're the leaves in mid-August And I've come out here to say
So we did what we could with this tomato. Um, Dave says that it's, it's our fault for not pruning it earlier in the season, right Dave? Yeah. So. Because um, there's too many long side Yes, branches. and we weren't expecting them to be, we were expecting different tomatoes and they are this kind. So now we're going to go on and look at my compost bin. Any other things you want to say about Tidying up a fall garden, Dave. Well, this is the, it's about the end of, well, middle, end of September. Mm -hmm. Now, you, it looks like there's a ton of tomatoes, but probably in about a month, uh, it'll be the end of tomato season here in Virginia. So you want to think like all this space that they're taking up, you can clear them out and put something else there for the fall that likes the cool weather, lettuce or some kind of, you wouldn't want to put a heavy feeder, but yeah. you could put a light feeder or a... Uh, so what would you put in this bed? I put like maybe fava beans. Fava beans, right, because that's a heavy feeder. Heavy giver. A heavy giver. <laughs> a heavy giver, and that means you want to follow a heavy feeder like tomato with a heavy giver like a bean, and we got to put those in. Do you have fava beans? I saw peas. Uh, you got to put those in pretty quickly. So the fava beans, there aren't a ton of varieties. Yeah, Lorraine, um, right? The one that I really that. like, I didn't like Lorraine. Uh, oh. The one that I like a lot is this heirloom one called Precoci Violetta. Uh-huh. But it's hard to find. So the standard one is called Windsor. And it's okay, but it tends to fall over. So you may have to stake them. Right. I feel like I could just stay here forever and and never get done with this tomato vine. So I'm going to <laughs> I'm going to resist the temptation to do that. Tuck you in there. Look, now we have some breathing room to actually weed underneath. Not that all those weeds are bad, but these thistles get in the way of harvesting. All right. So let's go and check out the worm bins. All right, welcome to my, uh, this is basically like a garden shed on our property and used to be a smoke house, I believe for the deer. Somebody liked to shoot game and hang them on hooks here. Um, but we've, I'm using it for storing vermicompost and pots and things like that. So, uh, garden tools. So today I'm gonna show you my vermicompost bins. And what I mean by that, here is bin number one. Whoa, don't know if you can see them. Here are my red, 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 ugh, my red wriggler worms. These are Isenia fetida. And they are fantastic composters. They eat up your food scraps, but you want to make sure you don't, in any, as in any compost bin, you want to make sure that you put in a good amount of non-food things like paper, carbon-based things, because your food scraps will provide the nitrogen for um, the worms, but it won't provide the carbon, which you need to get nice, healthy, fertile soil from, from the worms, you know. And, and this balance, you can see, let me see if I have it here. Nope. This balance of carbon and nitrogen produces really rich, fertile soil. Let's see if I can come closer and you can see what I mean by that, uh, is it not, the sun is not really capturing this, is it? There we go, all right, nice fertile soil. 
You'll also see this is not just a red wriggler worm compost bin, but a black soldier fly larva <laughs> bin, a uh, mealworm bin, which is great for our chickens because the chickens love the mealworms and they're great composters too. They just compost in a different way. I'm not going to go into detail about that and bore you. That'll be another video if you're interested in vermicomposting, uh, black soldier larva, or mealworm composting. This is just to say that one of the things that you can do for fall garden maintenance is to compost, especially all the refuse that we had um, gotten from the, the garden. So that's going to a different bin. That's not even going to a bin, that's going to a pile. And you may want to, because of your context, maybe you live in the suburbs, maybe you live in the city, you may want to have a bin as your composting place for both your um, food scraps and your garden debris. And, and also for your paper. You know, when your kids bring home lots of paper from school, we waste so much paper here in the United States, in my opinion. And all that paper could be turned into soil. So cardboard, bills, you know, that, and of course not plastic. So whenever you see plastic, that's not gonna break down in your bin. Or if it is, the mealworms are gonna eat it little by little bit because they're finding now, but it's not good. It's not good stuff. So let's put that in the trash, in a trash bag here. So what am I doing now is I'm gonna feed them my food scraps, one from the garden and also from our our own veggie scraps. This is probably enough for a whole week of eating, feasting for them. And because that's a lot of food and it's hard for them to digest all of that in one go and they don't like lemons, you also need to add some carbon. So carbon in the form of your brown straw or paper. There is a specific carbon to nitrogen ratio that is recommended and that's one is to four so more carbon than nitrogen so one part nitrogen four parts carbon so if I put a lot of nitrogen in here I'm gonna end up with a soggy bin and not happy worms worms that are escaping like these guys I want them to be happy and if it gets too wet for them that's when they escape when when a bin gets too wet because there's too much of the food scraps, that's when you want to add a little bit of, this is wood chips, just to even it out, high in carbon. And just mix it all up and more. And so when I do my compost bin, home I try to line it with paper and then you can get your shredder paper shredder and add the contents of that in here too also incidentally if you use carbon you increase the fungal presence of beneficial fungi in your soil which is what we actually want to like have more stable soil to break things down faster and Car uh, so they they favor carbon trees, wood chip mulch, paper more than the food scraps. So food scraps are you favor bacterial compositions, so uh, populations. And what exactly those bacterial populations are is the study of a research that I'm currently conducting with Southern Sayre. I will save that for another video. All right, so we did that one compost. I'm also going to be. What else do do? So yeah, there's other ways to compost. There's a compost bin that you turn around and around. That's where the other food scraps are. The worms can't really eat that much. Like this is enough for one week. There's another worm bin. This one's 
stabilized a lot because it used to be really wet. Whoa, it's also very heavy now. And now they like it because I put some more carbon in there. Mm, still wet in the bottom. Ooh, look at that. And I think they've eaten everything that this bin has to offer. So they are likely hungry, guys. Oh my gosh, look at that. They are just in here. Now they could survive on just paper alone, honestly. <laughs> and some vermicomposters, people who grow worms for a living, will make sure that the materials in their compost bin are more carbon heavy than they are nitrogen. Yeah, I don't like how it's so wet in my single. And I actually do not have my thing that I I turn the compost bin. It's not smelling too good either. So I'm going to go ahead and add the wood chip in here. Turn it around a bit. So composting, this is a small scale composting <laughs> experiment. You could do this in a big pile. You could do this in um, wooden pallets that we have outside. This is not a good smelling pile. So the main thing is you want to maintain these bins by checking them, I would say, at least once a week. Especially if you're working with red rigger worms and you don't want them to die in the cold or the heat. Or that, in this case, I think they're not breathing well because they're all getting matted down there. I think this may have been a bin that was overfed with food scraps. So I'm just going to get this bed to stabilize by aerating it a bit. And then you'll see the effects of those in a few days will be better better for the worms. Whew. Not good. Okay. Yes. Nice thing is I think that it is airy but these these holes are still If I had paper, I'm probably going to come back and put some, some paper in here and help them along like by cutting up the paper so they can actually eat it because that's unshootable to them right now. Okay. All right, so I think this about rounds up those six steps. We have harvesting. Oh no, we have one more. Harvesting, tidy up, maintenance. <laughs> and if you know what those, if, if you're not sure what those entail, um, you can check out the link below for more details on how to do that. We went through some of them in this video. Harvesting, tidying, maintenance, composting, and repotting. Um, yeah. The next thing I'd like to do is bring in some of the plants that I think I can bring in and I'll show you in a little bit what that is, but I hope that this has been helpful so far. Okay, so this is our round worm bin, uh, not worm bin, but uh, compost bin. And you can have this at, uh, thanks to, shout out to Mr. Pankaw of Green Network and Leah Loudon Environmental Education Alliance. Um, he gave this to me <laughs> when he retired um, and he had used it in his school before then. So what this does is gives you an opportunity to really mix up the different components of compost and thereby um, get yourself um, 
get the process going faster, so accelerating the composting process. So generally, it should just heat up if you had the right ratio of carbon to nitrogen, but if you don't, you can still accelerate the process of decomposition with the help of worms. So we have some mealworms in here as well. And in the end, it's really just the bacteria and the worms that do it for us, whether or not, you know, oh, it's a hot process or a, a slow composting process. It's just the hot process is, um, it's faster. And it kills pathogens if you leave it and uh, in the heat, if it, if it heats up to 100 and I can't remember now, 150. Um, but here's what's in here. Not much decomposition happening. I'm going to add our food scraps in there. So let's see. And like I mentioned, same thing with a vermicompost bin. I know this is always so low that you can't see my face, so let me just raise this. Same thing with a worm, the vermicompost bin. If you have too much nitrogen, it doesn't bode well for you. It's not a good thing to have too much nitrogen because then it's going to get all slimy. And so there you have it. Let's review our checklist and see if we did everything garden tidy up. <laughs> Checklist said we should. So we harvested and right now in your garden you can still be harvesting a lot of the cucumbers, tomatoes, peppers, um, pumpkins, cabbage, yarrow, tulsi, Turkish rocket. These are things that are are coming up in our gardens and don't forget the flowers because this is one of the the reasons that we like to grow flowers you want to harvest them in the right time and not just keep them in your garden um, to bring joy to your own home and then we cleaned up as well rake the leaves from the paths cut down all the vines as you saw as trellis what needs to be trellised um, take us take stock of your tools and wash them so I have a lot of netting that I need to wash drain your rain barrel gather debris and trash Turn over your pots if you're going to store them for the winter. Um, and then maintenance. Cut down your plants, maintaining your plants. Cut down plants that are overgrown down to their stems, such as uh, you saw me do in the rhubarb. You could do that with the tomatoes. Um, but for the perennials, you don't prune those perennials quite yet. As much as we wanted to prune the raspberries because we didn't prune them, we have to wait on that one. Um, and then repots. I'm gonna go over here and show you a little pot I have here. This is sayote. <laughs> I got this from California and I've repotted it. It's not gonna grow outside in the, in the fall anymore, but it's gonna grow indoors for me and hopefully at least I can use the leaves if no fruit comes of it. And I'll just it's just great to like experience growing something you've never grown before. I have a lot more weeding to do for sure. So let's get back to that checklist. Okay, straw or wood chip mulch your paths or your beds, compost the debris and assemble your hoop houses, that's maintenance. And repotting, there's some things to consider, like if you wanted to grow berries indoors, like blueberries or strawberries even, or figs, you can. And, and herbs, don't forget, you can repot your herbs, you can start your herbs, reroot them, and then start them indoors if you wanted to. Uh, the garden season is never over. <laughs> it doesn't have to be over in the fall or the summer. You can keep on the harvest going and you don't have to make it overwhelming. You can just do one thing, one thing that you want to continue growing indoors. And then composting. So we did the composting, as I mentioned. There's different ways to do it. There's an 18 day hot compost street tracker because you can make hot compost in 18 days. You just have to turn it every other day. And there's like a tracker to show you when you're supposed to turn it in this 
um, PDF that you can download. And then finally, the sixth step is notes of repair. Like, what are your notes? What are your, the things that you need to repair in your garden? Like, if you need to do a new, in our case, there's a lot. We need to do a whole fence install. Um, do you have to readjust your rain barrel? Do you have to put stone for the pathways? Not necessarily a repair, but an improvement, right? Um, how do you organize your hose reel? And, how, and then, uh, what do you intend to do for the next season? And that's where Dave was talking earlier about following a heavy feeder, such as a tomato, with a heavy giver, like a fava bean, which is a spring legume, a heavy giver, basically, that gives back to the soil, because all legumes are nitrogen fixers. That means they bring up nitrogen from the soil and they make it available to the surrounding plants or to their area. So even if they die, then you have nitrogen fixing bacteria in your soil. And that's it. So if you have any garden tips of your own for the fall garden maintenance, please um, post them. I'm not sure if there's a comments below. I can't always monitor the comments. But if you go to permaculturegardens.org, I'd love to continue the conversation over there. Sign up for a newsletter, sign up for this street tracker, and we'll see you again in our next